And uh, as folks are now starting to come into the room, uh, we'll be waiting just a minute to get everybody in here. Uh, and I'd just also like to mention that we typically do record these sessions and uh, you know, uh, we put them uh, on the website as available for people to, to stream if that's, uh, if that's something that's okay as well. Um, I'll, I'll touch base with you, Mariana, before we do that, make sure that that, that works. Okay, yeah, that's fine. All right, well, I'll get things kicked off as people are still making their way into the webinar. Uh, so I would just like to welcome everybody who is in attendance today uh, on behalf of the Biomaker Space and the Biomaker Student Group. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody for this uh, next installment of our COVID-19 Biomaking Solutions Virtual Seminar Series. Uh, hopefully you all can see up on the screen real quick the just some of the background and references and, and resources. Uh, if you'd like more information about the Biomaker Space or the student group, there are contact emails. Our emailing lists uh, are also shown on the slide. You can self-subscribe or you can um, contact any one of us and we'll help you add to the email list. We have a website specifically for the seminar series where you can sign up for and register for upcoming talks, as well as see uh, videos that are available and posted for previous talks. Um, up here, we have uh, the, the flyer with the seminar lineup as well. I would like to call everyone's attention. This is not updated, but we have added a new speaker. So let me get this up on the screen. Um, so for uh, July 29th, we have Pranam uh, Chatterjee, and he'll be uh, speaking about uh, computation-mediated protein engineering of robust genome editing and antiviral tools against SARS-CoV-2. So this should be another uh, exciting talk that we have. Um, like all the other talks, this one it will be a Wednesday uh, at noon. They're all Wednesday, Thursday dates, uh, timeframes. So a couple quick notes for our, our webinars before we, we jump in. Uh, please hold questions until the end uh, on the participants tab. Uh, when you do have a question, you can use the raise hand icon. I'll bring you off mute. Uh, you can ask your question directly uh, to our speaker. Uh, if you have any trouble with that, um, reach out, let me know, and I will try to assist you. Um, other note is just as with uh, any of our talks uh, and over the past couple, uh, past couple of months, we've had uh, talks from academia and from industry. We just like to ask that folks, um, you know, respect that we're seeing this information ahead of publication and uh, not uh, disclose or uh, share what you're hearing here without explicit permission from the presenter. Okay. Uh, otherwise, um, We'd like to get things started, so I'd like to hand off to uh, Professor Angela Belcher to introduce our speaker. Hi, well, welcome to the Biomaker Space. Um, it's uh, great to invite everyone here today, and I'm particularly excited uh, about our, our speaker uh, today, Dr. Mariana Mattis, who's an MIT alum, and uh, she's also a CEO and co-founder of Biobot Analytics. And she's here to, show, um, to share with you today um, some of the, the technology and the really um, fascinating work um, that they're doing around wastewater epidemiology. And um, I didn't look at, the, don't have a title right here, but I'm uh, assuming that she's going to talk today as it related to uh, COVID-19, uh, but maybe also share with us the, the, the approach and the fundamental technology that, um, that uh, she and her team have been developing. Well, she's been um, running interdisciplinary teams of uh, of engineers, biologists, chemists, and data scientists for about 10 years. Um, she came to us from uh, MIT, from um, Universidad um, Nacional Autónoma uh, de uh, Mexico. <laughs> Sorry, that's uh, uh, um, in, in Mexico, studying genomic science um, and genomics. And then she did her PhD at MIT in computational and systems biology. 
um, she's done a lot of uh, a fascinating work and was uh, involved in um, setting up and developing um, different groups while she was here at MIT. Uh, and I do want to recognize one uh, recent award, which is the Trailblazer um, from uh, Chemical and Engineering News in, in 2020. Uh, so I couldn't be more delighted to in, uh, invite her here today to speak to our community uh, about the very important work uh, that she's doing. So Dr. Mattis. Thank you, Dr. Belcher. And thank you, Justin, for the invitation. Happy to be here. Um, I'm gonna start projecting my deck. Uh, I have slides to speak for about 30 minutes, which should leave us enough time to take questions and have a conversation towards um, the second half of the hour. So I'm gonna, with that, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. And uh, please let me know if you can see that. Can you see my slide there? Everything looks good. Yep. Okay, great. Um, I am, uh, as Dr. Bolcher uh, men mentioned, I am one of the co-founders and CEO of Biobot Analytics. And um, before diving into our COVID-19 work, I want to take a moment to talk a bit more about why we started Biobot in the first place. So uh, really our, our vision is that we can do population health analytics by, uh, from data collected uh, from wastewater. And the motivation for this was that really our systems uh, to protect public health are not built for today's reality. Um, I think that really the best example we can use today is to look at our response to COVID-19 where, you know, um, we knew in early in the year that there was this new outbreak, this new infectious disease agent, that it had started in China and that eventually it was going to make it all the way here, uh, just given how connected the world is. And yet um, there was really not much of a preparation ahead of that. And we just kind of let it spread through the country and basically land us in a place where we had to lock down the entire economy, the um, activity um, to try to prevent further spread. And we think that that's a problem that when we have a new outbreak, we let it grow until it becomes an epidemic. The same has happened for opioids. I'm sure many of you have heard, if not, if not everyone has heard about the opioid epidemic, which also has reached you know, the, the point in which uh, it was becoming, I, I believe, the number one um, really uh, reason why uh, people were dying um, in the country before COVID-19. Hep C, um, hep meth, cocaine consumption. There's many other public health issues that we face and that we kind of just let them grow in the background until they affect millions of people with a very big uh, just cost to in terms of people and you know lives lost but also in economic terms we also believe that you know we can stop them that we don't need to let them grow and expand um, until they, they reach this epidemic level we have a ton of new technologies available and i think there's just so much more we can do to intervene early and to make public health preventative and to be more precise. Something that I want to highlight is that when we think about medicine, I think that people have become much more comfortable and aware that medicine can be done more proactively and you know, more personalized, if you will, to specific individuals. When we think about public health, a lot of these concepts and a lot of these technologies haven't really been ex extended to think about community level and to think about the problems, the health problems that affect us as a, as a community, that affect everyone. I think you can all understand when we think about, for example, COVID-19, how um, really like it's the community as a whole that can 
um, change the course of the infection? And uh, again, what interventions can be done at that level, not at the individual level, but at the community level? Um, at at BioBot, really, our vision is that we are building an early warning um, system, really building public health analyt <clears throat> analytics from data available in our city sewers. And the reason why we say that is because every time that we flush the toilet, we are sending away a valuable medical sample that contains information about our health and about our well-being. And at the moment, um, this information is considered just waste. Waste that needs to be sent to a treatment plant for um, cleanup before it goes back out into the environment. What we see is not waste, but a huge data asset that is updated literally continuously through the day, every day, everywhere around the world. And therefore our vision is that one day, every city, every town in our country, but also internationally, just globally, will have the technologies to analyze wastewater and to really extract all sorts of data layers about the community health. And you know, if we think that the internet has a lot of information being produced minute to minute, wastewater is such, the wastewater infrastructure is another system that has that feature because we're just all constantly consuming and um, using the toilet. So that's really our vision to make these uh, type of technology be part of basic infrastructure available everywhere and to make this type of data to be adopted and to really change um, the entire healthcare industry. Um, so in, in the end, you know, the benefits of thinking about this type of technology is that we can be more inclusive and we can be more proactive about protecting the health of our communities. As a more personal note, when I started my career, um, you know, I've always been involved in the space of uh, computational biology, bioinformatics, genomics, um, all of the later omics technologies, um, and a natural path for people who specialize in that field is to go into the space of personalized medicine and, you know, all of the new treatments and diagnostics that are being created. And to me, that always that didn't feel satisfying enough because I felt that most of those solutions are built for uh, like, you know, the people who can afford it and not for the entire society. And I think like this is an application where we can really think about how to apply all of those very um, cutting edge technologies to solutions that will be more inclusive because everybody has a voice in the sewer and you know, it doesn't matter if you don't have healthcare coverage and you cannot go to the doctor or to the hospital to get attention. In this system, as long as people are using the toilet, like they, they count and their information gets counted. And in my opinion, can be a better way to understand needs and allocate resources, a more fair way um, to distribute resources to communities uh, rather than just taking into account the hospital level data. So let's talk a little bit how it works. So again, the process begins when we are using the toilet. Um, then we have to think about how to get a wastewater sample out. And here we have two challenges. The first one is that by design, and obviously this is a good decision, wastewater is kept pretty away from people, very inaccessible, right? It's in pipes that are running underground where people don't really have easy access to it. Um, and second is that the wastewater system, uh, again, is constantly changing because we're constantly using uh, the bathroom, we're taking showers, we're doing laundry, we're washing dishes. So how you collect the sample from that 
literal ocean of water largely determines the quality of the data that you get. Therefore, um, with these two constraints, our team has designed a patent pending sampling device that can be deployed in sewer manholes and basically anywhere in the wastewater network. So we can be capturing the information from a specific city, we can be capturing the information from a specific neighborhood, or um, as we've seen interest now with COVID-19, could be even from smaller communities like nursing homes or places of work or university campuses. Next, um, it's, this is still a sampler. So the samples that are collected are sent back to the lab where they undergo analysis and we can apply, you know, we apply molecular biology analysis, chemical analysis to create different types of data layers. At the moment, our team can look not only at COVID-19, but you know, we can look at, uh, I believe about 100 different types of chemical molecules, including opioids, but also other pharmaceutical products and substances of public health interest. Um, and we imagine that suite of lab assays growing, ever growing over time. For example, this fall, we'd like to also launch an influenza assay so that we can understand kind of flu and COVID-19 in parallel from the communities that we're working with. And then the most important piece of this is that, you know, that data report that goes back to our customers. So um, at the moment, our customers have been mostly uh, government agencies, so health departments, and then lately also uh, wastewater treatment plants that are collaborating with health departments to create COVID-19 data. Um, but more and more we're seeing interest from other type of customers, again, like companies that are putting together their back to work plans, their back to work or back to school plans, and they want to understand how this data can supplement the individual level testing that they are doing to maintain a healthy community. So our customers are paying really for that report that is going back to them. All of the intermediate steps are a technology platform to enable the delivery of that report, but really the value, the reason why people um, come to us and contract BioBot is because they want that report. And that report also, you know, it has more information than a simple laboratory result. We make some nice time, and time series analysis for them. We do hotspot analysis for them. We make, um, we're starting to make now predictions for them as well. And that's, that's why they work with us. That's uh, really the core of our company and where, you know, if I can describe BioBot in one sentence is that we are a public health data science company. Uh, before COVID-19, so basically at the beginning of the year, we were fully dedicated to delivering our first product, which was addressing the opioid crisis. Uh, we had finished successfully um, our first pilot with the town of Cary in North Carolina, where uh, the town saw a decrease, a 40% decrease in overdoses in the first six months of working together, and where they really credited these amazing result to the fact that they could create and target the right educational messages and campaigns for different neighborhoods in their town, depending on what our data was showing to be the priority. So they were able to talk about the specific opioid crisis of a neighborhood and therefore have more success um, and a better intervention targeted for that. You know, is it more a prescription opioid problem? Is it more of a street opioid problem? Um, versus just talking like in general, like in abstract ways about the opioid crisis. We also had uh, seven pilots happening in the state of Massachusetts, plus starting one with the city of Boston, um, and had gathered support from Governor Baker, Mayor Walsh, and uh, even uh, Secretary Admiral Dr. Uruar, who works at the federal level uh, HHS. Then COVID-19 hit 
and basically all of our customers suddenly changed their focus from opioids into COVID-19 because again, these are health departments within government. And we quickly, very quickly realized that, you know, we needed to adapt um, our technology to put a solution for COVID-19. And in February, we had the first reports that the virus SARS-CoV-2 is shed in stool of uh, COVID-19 positive patients. Uh, that told us right away that if it was shed in stool, then it was in theory possible to detect it in the wastewater. So we set up a quick pilot um, with uh, collecting some samples from the Deer Island wastewater treatment plant that captures the water from about 2 million people in the city of Boston and in the greater Boston area in particular. So um, I have here actually a link to the preprints where we successfully report not only the detection, but quantification of this uh, novel coronavirus in wastewater samples, where we showed that we could successfully detect it in the wastewater um, using qPCR. And uh, you can see here the team that we put together. It was not only BioBot, we had uh, Professor Eric Ohm from the um, Biological Engineering Department at MIT, where, where I did my PhD as well as collaborators across uh, multiple institutions, um, really working together to crack through this paper. I can tell you that uh, we were the first team in the US to report the su successful detection of SARS-CoV-2. We were only second in the world <laughs> after a, a research team in the Netherlands um, uh, got there first by a couple of days, but um, these were like really exciting times where basically nobody was having weekends to, to try to quickly make it happen. Uh, and based on that successful detection here in Massachusetts, we decided to launch uh, a pro bono campaign in collaboration with these academic groups. Basically, we were going to encourage wastewater treatment plants to send wastewater samples back to Biobot for uh, the analysis of the virus. And our objective was at that point still very research oriented of you know, wanting to understand if the detection was really reliable across different types of wastewater, but also to understand if people care about this. We didn't want to start offering this as a service if people were just not interested and fully busy with just looking at the confirm clinical cases from hospitals, which is the alternate metric. Um, so we internally, we said, okay, if we can onboard 100 wastewater treatment plants, you know, that would be a very successful pro bono campaign. We would learn a ton. It would give us feedback that people are interested in this. And what happened is that basically, we made this little website here. We announced the campaign on Twitter and it just exploded. Basically, we reached the target of having 100 participating wastewater treatment plants within 10 days. And in fact, we had to uh, increase the, the size of the campaign since we had hundreds, literally hundreds of wastewater treatment plants in a waiting list wanting to participate. So we ended up accepting 400 wastewater treatment plants that uh, were representing 42 states, about 10% of the US population, and that were sending samples every week. The samples they were sending were only like 50 mLs of wastewater since we had previously shown in our pilot here in Massachusetts that that was enough to detect the coronavirus. Um, just as a comparison, actually during this time period, which was April and May, uh, clinical testing had only reached about 1% of the U.S. population. So that really highlights the scalability of wastewater where you can, you know, with 400 samples analyzed, uh, you can analyze 10% of the U.S. population. So it's very, very powerful, very scalable. And we could actually be testing 75% of the U.S. population with, you know, 
10,000 samples per week, which uh, if we compare it again with the clinical numbers, it's like really, really nothing compared to what we would need to do if we wanted to test person by person. We also noticed, you know, during this pro bono campaign that wastewater epidemiology was having like a big moment of public attention. We received coverage by tons of very prestigious publications, including, you know, Vice and Forbes and Politico and New York Times, Stat News, Washington Post, you know, and it, it really felt like people were paying attention, that people understood kind of what wastewater can do for you um, and the advantages of testing the wastewater and really saw a lot of uh, kind of momentum, not only from the government side, but also from the general public, which was very encouraging because when we founded the company, that was always identified as a big risk. You know, are people going to be okay with the testing of wastewater? You know, it's uh, obviously it's an anonymous test by nature since it's basically a mixture of, uh, of just substances that has happened in the wastewater, but you know, you just never know basically at kind of what's going to be the public reaction. And in this case, it's been extremely positive in our website. Actually, we receive to this day so many notes from just like general citizens that want to show their support. Our Twitter is also like very supportive. Um, people are very supportive of the approach. And we have also seen a large growth of research within the academic community. So before all of this happened, you know, I could literally count with the fingers in one hand how many groups in the U.S. were working in wastewater epidemiology. And after this moment, actually, we've seen that also the, the scientific research has proliferated. Like suddenly, you know, you have dozens of, of, of groups across the nation now suddenly doing wastewater epidemiology research, which I think is also like really amazing. And I'm going to show you here one. I'm approaching the end of my presentation, but I want to show you um, one piece of data that we are close to publishing. And so as a sneak peek, this is more data collected here in Massachusetts. And basically what we did was to analyze uh, samples collected from January because uh, the, the treatment plant actually keeps a biobank of samples going back several months. So we were able to analyze samples collected all the way from January to now um, end of June. And basically this is how the data from the wastewater looks like. Um, the samples were negative until early March when we know that the outbreak reached Massachusetts. Um, in fact, we, we saw positives in the wastewater a few days before the first confirmed clinical cases, um, which um, is something that has happened in other locations as well. People have seen that you can see the, the result positive in wastewater before the first confirmed clinical cases. Then um, the load of the virus really went exponentially up uh, over the next few weeks until the stay at home order was issued by the governor. And that helped to level off the amount of virus in the wastewater, as you can see in the community. Although it really didn't go down, it's taken quite some time for the effect of the you know, social distancing to really take effect. And you can see here now in the reopening phase how fortunately, um, based on the data that we have, it seems that the reopening that has been happening in this state, as well as the protests that have happened, haven't really increased the load of the virus in the community. Um, two more comments about this is that uh, the during the basically in between the issuing of the stay at home order and the reopening where we don't really see going the, the virus going down our hypothesis is that there may be communities that didn't benefit from the stay at home order so if we still had essential workers or homeless people kind of very active and exposed this could be explaining why we still saw like a 
you know, constant level of the virus in the community. And the other piece, of course, is that it's good to see that despite the reopening, we continue going down so far. And we want to keep looking. We're actually, um, the state of Massachusetts has now signed a contract with us to continue this testing through the end of the year, since we want to keep a look as to what's happening. And the, the other piece that we are, uh, have recently published about is that the level of the virus in the wastewater actually gives you an early warning. It gives you, it's a leading indicator for new COVID-19 cases that you're going to see over the next four to seven days. And the reason for that um, is because, so, so wastewater in a way is giving you a measure of incidence, so new cases rather than prevalence, current cases. Um, and we dived into that question because we were seeing discrepancies between the numbers that we were estimating versus the confirmed clinical cases. And again, the conclusion was that um, it seems that uh, basically shedding in stool happens mostly pre-symptoms. So you will see that signal in the wastewater before people develop symptoms and go to the doctor and get a test and get confirmed. And, and that's why you get like about a seven day window or heads up about the level of infection where you're going to be next week. So that's incredibly valuable. And again, something that has been facilitated by the pro bono campaign and working together with um, like our collaborators. But yeah, as of June 1st, we have actually now switched into a full paid service since what we saw is that the treatment plans want to leverage this early warning uh, or like leading indicator aspect of the wastewater. So they want their data right away. They want their data next day or like, you know, 48 hours later. Um, and it's only really possible to deliver that level of service if we have a big team and are like really ded fully dedicated to it. So uh, that's why since uh, early June, we are now also offering it as a service uh, where treatment plants communities can pay for this and get the data pretty quickly. Um, and just to conclude that all of this started doing my PhD at MIT where, you know, I worked with a large group of collaborators across four departments in the university to, to launch the Underworlds project. Um, and where I was lucky to meet my co-founder, Nusha Gailey, who was in the laboratory of Professor Calorati in the Department of Urban, Urban Studies and Planning. You can get a sense here of our uh, advisors, medical, scientific, product-wise, investors. And I think with that, um, I will finish here and uh, proceed to take questions and have a conversation with you guys. Excellent, thanks. So we've got the uh, first question up here from uh, Melody. Cool, awesome. Um, I've, I really was really excited for this talk because I followed Biobot Analytics for a while now. Um, I was really curious, do you think the data that you're able to capture with the testing uh, captures uh, vulnerable populations on a community, community level better than like typical testing would do? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think especially since uh, many of the most vulnerable populations don't really have access to good healthcare. Um, I think that's where we can also see discrepancies, right? They, they are not tested. They don't contribute to the numbers. Um, but in our data, they, they show up. And in fact, we actually did a pilot in the city of Boston where we sampled from different parts of the city. And what we saw was a very strong spatial heterogeneity where, you know, it was very clear that the, most of the signal was coming from a few communities. And, and then you look, okay, what communities are these? And it's the communities that have very poor access to healthcare, low income. So based on the, at least on that pilot, what we've seen is that also the virus is impacting more the more vulnerable populations. 
Um, can I add a follow-up question to that? <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, so I was wondering, um, have you also considered then like working with contact tracing initiatives or like working with other, or are you ready working with state or local governments on like ways in which this could be used for contact tracing, at least in terms of like on a community level to understand that and does the data in terms of sensitivity decrease though as like cases decrease to more an individual or household level? That's interesting. Uh, no, we haven't talked about contact tracing in particular, but um, we do believe obviously like this is one data layer of like the five or six that people should be looking at when making decisions about reopening versus stay in lockdown. So uh, like, yeah, I definitely, I, I'm not sure how it interfaces with contact tracing in particular, but for example, um, when doing a random survey in an area side by side with our analyses, like would allow you to better calibrate the modeled number of cases that we get out of the wastewater, for example. Like, so there, there's like, in our opinion, like this data obviously don't, doesn't replace the clinical testing and should be like one of the five streams that people look at side by side when making the decision. Cool, thank you very much. And got another question from uh, Christopher. Hello, th thanks very much for taking my question. I was wondering if the idea of a super spreader, which is in the realm of uh, respiratory viral uh, droplets, an individual who might expel large numbers of respiratory droplets leading to an increased uh, numbers of infected uh, people in the local area might also apply here. If, if you found any evidence that one individual might have orders of magnitude more secretion into the stool than others, and whether that might uh, sway or, or change the analysis or whether you can account for that. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's definitely large variation person to person when you look at shedding and that also happens in stool, in stool shedding. However, so in the beginning when we just got started, that was our main concern. Like how, you know, how does that person to person variability influence the results that we see. Now, after having done it, you know, for the past two to three months and analyzed like, I don't know, close to 2000 samples from across the country, actually what we believe is that the biggest signal in the wastewater is coming from the time in the infection cycle in which the person is at. So um, we have very, very, strong compelling evidence that there's a large spike in shedding in stool in the first three days post-infection, which is still pre-symptoms, pre-symptomatic, it's a pre-symptomatic time. Um, and that that's actually the main signal that we see in the wastewater, other than, you know, as you say, maybe like contribution from a super spreader, super spreader or something. It seems that it's the time of the infection which determines the main signal that we see in the wastewater. So I think for now, um, for now we have a little bit like made our peace with the question of that like super spreader or like person to person variability, just given how the data is looking at, um, that seems to be again, quite consistent with the levels of reported cases that we see a few days later. Thank you. One quick question I had, Mariana, was uh, on your chart, there was a very good alignment and overlay between the reported cases. Did, did you shift the timeline of one of those? Uh, was that observable, that shift that was related to the ability to detect earlier in your samples as opposed to the reported cases? Yeah, I feel, this figure I feel like doesn't quite highlight that aspect of it. But basically what we did is to take the wastewater data, we can, from it, we can estimate how many people were shedding for us to see that level. And then we can compare that with a number of, of confirmed clinical cases. Um, and what happens is that basically those two numbers correlate amazingly, but only a few days later. 
-hmm. not on the same day, not on previous days. And it's, there's a very specific window of time where, where we see a significant correlation and that's four to seven days later. And from there we did then modeling as to how the shedding in stool needs to look like for us to see that. And again, providing these uh, insights that probably the main signal we see is from new infections. People who just got infected and are going through that like early spike in the shedding. Hmm. Very interesting. Um, all right, we'll take a question from Adil. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, I had a question related to uh, the last one that you were just talking about. Uh, you mentioned that uh, it was possible to use this wastewater um, to do a lot of preventative things even before, uh, even before seeing a lot of clinical data from testing. Mm -hmm. And I, I was just trying to understand better exactly how, because there is variability in the amount of uh, you know, virus that will potentially be shed and the different avenues by which it could be shed, be shedded um, if you're just collecting wastewater. So how do you get that normalization to get, to kind of get a, like a number of uh, patients? Because if, unless you have like some standard person or some, some, some individual data to then get a good sense of what that copy number should look like, Mm -hmm. and uh and then use that to then uh, use that then to look back at the data that you collected and say okay based on the expected number of copies then then this is the number that should be you know that that's like my understanding of like how it would work but um it seems that you were saying there was a different strategy that wasn't that if yeah you could clarify that so basically yeah, basically it's, it works similar to what you're describing, right? So you measure a concentration in the wastewater and then you want to go from that to approximately how many people were shedding for you mm -hmm. to see that concentration, which then means you have to assume what's the average number of concent or like the average concentration found in a single person. So um, when we started doing the work, again, like the main, main concern was what you're expressing. Obviously, there's variation in the shedding um, that's going to, you know, is it fair to assume an average for all people? Uh, you know, is that really informative or not? And I would say how, where we're at right now is that it seems that just that effect tends to average out at the population level and that the, what's driving the signal and the quality of the data and what you can say are other things other than that. For example, uh, how the sample was collected, if there was rain, if there was like basically the dilution effects in the system mm -hmm. have a way bigger impact in what you see than that person to person because you are looking at a community. So um, where we have actually put attention to normalize the number and to be able to say something about it is how do we correct for the amount of poop that was in this sample? Okay. Because, right? Because if today, I don't know, I went out, I collected a sample, how many people were in that sample? How, the poop of how many people were in that sample? That seems to be the kind of a better corrector for all of these effects uh -huh. um, than going super deep into the modeling of how the shedding is working person to person. So uh, it was surprising to us because when we began the work, we actually thought we would need to dedicate most of our time to really model the different shedding types and all of that to get to a more accurate number. But again, based on all of our work, basically it seems that actually that's not the biggest contributor to the uncertainty in the data is just the pure effect of the infrastructure and dilution effects and all of that. So that's where we focused and now we have a control. Basically, we measure a second virus that is shedding okay. human tool and that uh, we can basically, it tells us basically how much poop, like how many, 
people were in that sample. Got it, got and it. That really helps kind of get a number that is meaningful. Got it, that makes sense. Um, I guess my, uh, I had uh, one other question, which was really about um, the like preservation strategies for all this, because it seems like there's just getting sewage samples is gonna be a lot of just like, you know, mixtures of different things. And I would just imagine that there'd be like quite a bit of degradation of any metabolites that you'd be interested in monitoring. Um, but perhaps that's not the case. Um, so I want to know, like, how do you guys deal with that, especially if like you're getting these samples from uh, these sewage plants and facilities who already have a backlog of samples? Are they using special um, preservative compounds to maintain the integrity or do you expect to have to do that in the future when you're monitoring uh, specific types of viruses that are less stable uh, mm -hmm. or other, other compounds? Yeah, I think like, so for now our only like sample preservation is temperature. So, you know, in the case of the larger Massachusetts analysis, uh, we were looking at samples stored since early January. So that was a bit of a different thing, but obviously for the samples that we're receiving like fresh, uh, we receive them at like four degrees Celsius or like fridge temperature, not even like fully frozen. And that seems to be totally, absolutely fine. Um, there's a loss, but it's not that dramatic that you would lose everything like right away. And in fact, just given just problems with shipping and customs because we have some customers out of the country. We've had cases where samples have stayed at room temperature for days and still they pass the analysis. I mean, we can detect the virus and we can also detect the control, the other, the secondary um, poop virus that we look for. So, which is also an RNA virus similar to SARS-CoV-2. So basically, I do think it's very like application dependent because some viruses are very labile in the environment, like outside the human body. And so far the evidence for SARS-CoV-2 is that actually it's quite resilient outside the human body. Um, and that may be partly explained because it likes to absorb to solids. So it seems that in the wastewater, basically what happens, probably what's happening most of the virus gets quickly absorbed to the solids and therefore it's like protected from all of the soaps and detergents and everything present in the liquid fraction. And that increases also its, its stability. So even like at room temperature, you can still see it days later. And I think there was a question in the chat about false positives. We actually think that our false positive rate is extremely low and the problem is a false negative, the false negative rate. Um, so uh, we have done tests where we have sequenced the qPCR products that we get a ton, and you know they are SARS-CoV-2. Um, we have tested samples that should be negative; they come back negative. So I don't think we have any problem with false positives, but I do think we have a problem with false negatives, where obviously you know, you need still like a cohort of people to be infected for us to see it in the wastewater. We cannot be at like a single person got infected for us to see it. Mira, what do you think that uh, limited section is and how do you handle the temporal and spatial variation within the sampling? So for temporal variation, uh, we collect what is called like a 24 hour composite sample mm -hmm. that basically samples the stream very frequently over a full day. And mm -hmm. what you want to accomplish is to try to get at least one toilet flush from every person in the community. But you can imagine if that sampling is sparse. So if you sample once every 60 minutes, you are losing toilet flushes from the other 59 minutes. So it's about like how it's not about volume, it's about how frequently you're getting a subsample of the stream. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, all right. Uh, next question up here we'll take from Islam. Uh, thank you very much, Justin and Mariana. So uh, we have seen reports saying that the number of clinically confirmed cases of COVID-19 are less than the actual cases in exposed communities, and that can be in the uh, apparent in the antibody testing that have been done in several states. Uh, I wonder if you are taking that into consideration when you say that the um, that the testing you do or the data from the wastewater testing correlates with the clinical data uh, with a few days window between them. Mm. We've, yeah, we're only looking at the confirmed clinical cases. So like the ones where they still do like a swab and QPCR, we're not comparing with the antibody results. Since, yeah. Yeah, could it be that the testing that you're, you're doing in the wastewater is showing the actual number of infected people while that the, or, or if it would make sense if we have a high antibody testing showing positive cases, then the tests that you're doing in wastewater would show more cases than the tests confirmed by the clinical. And that, uh, and that would kind of not show correlation between your testing and the clinical cases, but instead, be more on the line of your testing and the antibody testing? Like, does it make sense in a way or another? I mean, yeah. I, when we started, we had all these types of hypotheses of like, you know, maybe the discrepancy is because we are, there's like a large asymptomatic population. And, you know, yeah, if they were to get antibody testing, then maybe the numbers would, correlate better to our data. Maybe I think that's what you're asking um, versus like just looking at the swab positive testing. Um, the antibody would also show all of the asymptomatic. Um, however, again, that just like we, we really dived into that question because we wanted to understand why we have the discrepancy. And the result of that exploration was that Again, the, the shape of the shedding in stool of this, for this pathogen is what determines what you, the population you're capturing. In the case of SARS-CoV-2, our work and the work of actually another research group in Yale who has gotten the same results is that there's a large spike in shedding in stool early on, pre-symptomatic, and therefore wastewater is a measure of incidence, so new cases. There are other diseases, for example, polio, poliovirus, where you shed in stool throughout the infection, like through the cycle of the disease. In that case, wastewater is a measure of prevalence. And therefore, for each type of disease that we look at, um, understanding the shape of the curve um, is what will indicate to you if you're looking at prevalence or incidence. And we strongly believe that for SARS-CoV-2, the wastewater, uh, it's a measure of incidence. Thank you. And uh, just, Justin, just for you to know that I have a hard stop at one, so we we'll probably only have time for another question or two. Um, perfect. Well, so we got two in the chat uh, that are kind of both about location. So Melody was asking about location of sampling, if it was Massachusetts or elsewhere, uh, particularly hotspots. And then Rachel is asking uh, a bit about the network. Uh, that you can read in there and kind of at different points within the, the wastewater collection network. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the data that I presented was only for Massachusetts, um, although we have data from, yeah, from 42 states or so across the country. In general, the hotspots that we're seeing are the same as the confirmed clinical cases show. Um, and most, most of our sampling today, like 99% of the sampling, of the samples we get come from wastewater treatment plants. So where the resolution is like municipal level or even county level or even like multi-county level, like the treatment plant we have here in the Boston area, which represents four counties. Um, now, we've also begun to see a lot of interest to go more granular, in particular to communities that need back to work plants um, in that case, what needs to change is where in the network you get the sample. 
right? Choosing like the manhole that represents that community. Um, that opens some technical questions for sure for us because, you know, flow rates are smaller, like how much do people actually poop at work or in school, you know? Um, people are not living there. Like it's not the same application. If somebody would test positive, in theory, that person would actually go into quarantine at home and be removed from the initial like work or study community. So we think that for smaller communities, for that application, the data will actually be quite different. And the type of questions we can ask the data will be different. Probably more of a yes, it's there or not, rather than a trend, as we see it at the bigger level. But, uh, but yeah, in terms of how to make it happen, it's just about changing the location where you get the sample and making your sampling more, even more frequent. Because the more upstream you go, the more heterogeneity you have in the stream. Therefore, the more important it is that you sample very, very frequently. And uh, I think a great question here to end on with your last minute was from Cherry early on, where she was asking about what have been the most challenging aspects in the fast timescale pivot from uh, opioid to COVID-19 detection? Oh, it's been crazy. <laughs> I would say, I mean, the, the biggest challenge has been that while everything around us has slowed down, we had to ramp up. And that means, you know, in the, in the very, very beginning, we actually, you know, in early March, I remember we had to establish a policy of how people can work safely in the lab. And we were, you know, very proudly like, some of the very first ones before it was recommended to require mandatory face masks, mandatory temperature screening every day. Um, you know, we were able to put some plan in there. And to this day, like nobody in our team has been sick, which is amazing. You know, I'm sure, you know, I'm so proud of that. So in the very, very beginning, it was about how to have the lab team continue to be operational and how to do it safely when there were no guidelines. And then next is that we've been growing our team. Um, everybody had to change functions within the team because now we were mm. delivering a different product. And furthermore, we had to grow the team from five people that we were at the beginning of the year to about like 20 that we are today. And all of that has happened remotely with like, virtual interviews, virtual onboarding, virtual team meetings. And even to this day, there's a bunch of people in the team that I've never met in person, which is very strange. And I think that as the year continues, that's going to be the bigger challenge of how you build a good team culture um, in this purely remote space. Excellent. Well, we're right up against your time. So I want to say for everybody, thank you so much for taking the hour out of your day to come speak with us and tell us about the exciting work that you're doing. And we all uh, wish you the best uh, as you continue forward into this. And um, maybe we'll get an, an update at some point in the future. Yes, I'm getting in, touch, getting in touch if you want to work with us because we do still need a lot of people. So I'm <laughs> just putting it out there. <laughs> okay, thank bye. You. Thank bye. you. Bye. And uh, for everyone else, uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we will be having another talk uh, next week. Uh, Professor Bapta from uh, MIT Biological Engineering Department will be telling us about his work uh, in the vaccine space. So that will be on uh, July 16th, Thursday of next week. So thank everyone for joining me and have an excellent rest of your day. <laughs>